So it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce Shannon, uh, Dr. Shannon D. Williams to you as our final plenary speaker. Dr. Williams is associate professor in the history department at the University of Dayton, a historian of the African-American experience with research and te teaching specializations in women, religious, and the black freedom movement. Her work has been published in numerous journals, uh, America Magazine, National Catholic Reporter, the Journal of African American History, American Catholic Studies, and many others, the Washington Post. Most recently, Dr. Williams is the author of Subver Subversive Habits, Black Catholic Nuns in the Long African American Freedom Struggle published by Duke University Press. The book provides the first full history of Black Catholic nuns in the United States, chronicling their witness as pioneering religious leaders, educators, healthcare professionals, desegregation foot soldiers, Black power activists, and womanist theologians in a church and society that often did not wish to hear those kinds of voices. I want to just add a personal note uh, of excitement and gratitude for her presence here. Some 10 years ago when I was teaching in Cincinnati at Xavier University, I knew of her work and her research and I, and I learned that she was, um, to my delight, she was a postdoctoral fellow up in Cleveland uh, at Case Western. I was teaching, getting ready to teach a, a new course at Xavier called the Black Catholic Experience, um, in part out of my own love uh, and nurturing in Black Catholic communities as a white Catholic uh, who grew up in a very traditional suburban parish uh, in, in the South. And as I was reading Dr. Williams' work, I was lit up by the histories she was uncovering in particular, at the time, I was deeply moved and my, doing a little bit of my own research on Sister Thea Bowman, uh, who had become a kind of uh, muse for me, if you will, I, I dare say even a Sophia figure uh, in my own, my own spirituality, my own journey, uh, and attempt to think about and write about race in my church and in my society. So I invited her down, and she came down and spent a day with my class. And I'll tell you, uh, without hyperbole, it was the most electric class by far of the whole semester. She uncovered histories and inspired my students, many of whom were African-American, but had no idea, just no idea of the witness of, of Black women religious in our church. Some of them were from the Catholic Church, others were from outside, but to a person including myself, we were, we were deeply inspired and moved by her research. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Shannon D. Williams. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you all for being here today um, and for staying for this final plenary session. It truly is a privilege and an honor to be in community with you uh, this afternoon. Um, in celebration of the 18th meeting of the International Thomas Merton Society. And I would just like to take a moment before I begin my formal remarks to thank uh, the organizing committee, the program committee, and especially Dr. David Golomboski for inviting me to come and to share. In many ways, it's a bit surreal um, to be here um, in a community of Merton scholars, um, in part because I didn't know of Thomas Merton really um, until I came to my own research on Black Catholic sisters. And I say this as a cradle Catholic, uh, nothing in my religious education or secular education up until 2007 had included Thomas Merton. In fact, I only came to study this through my first encounter with a pioneering African-American sister uh, named Joyce Ruth Williams. 
1949, she became the first African-American to be admitted into the Order of St. Benedict in St. Joseph, Minnesota. She is a native of Summit, Mississippi, was a native of Summit, Mississippi, who migrated to Chicago after graduating high school and converted to Catholicism after volunteering with the Friendship House in Chicago, and also after reading Thomas Merton's The Seven Story Mountain. That was the first time that I had encountered um, Thomas Merton. She herself, like many pioneering Black sisters in white communities, faced great resistance to her presence. In fact, she applied in 1944, was denied on the admission, denied admission on the basis of race, but the community was so impressed with her application that they gave her a full scholarship to their college. She graduated in 1948 and was rejected again and told among many things that there was no work that she could do in the community, um, that they didn't know what her people ate. And she, even though she had been a four year residential student with the community at their college, but the following year, her college dean became the new leader of the community and she was admitted and she stays until her death. Um, Another African-American sister who converted to Catholicism after reading Thomas Merton's Seven Story Mountain was Phyllis Ray Johnson, a native of Detroit, Michigan and a graduate of Wayne State University. She was Episcopalian, converted to Catholicism and then like so many pioneering African-American sisters in white congregations experienced lots of rejections until she finally decided to take a couple of years off, learn French and apply to a French speaking Trappistine community in Canada, which she entered and remained into her death. The last connection that I wanna make between black sisters and Thomas Merton before I begin my formal remarks involves an African-American Catholic family that can trace their lineage to the earliest days of the church and specifically to the Holy Land of Kentucky. This particular family will give the, the Catholic church several pioneering black priests and black sisters, both as members of historically black orders, as well as a few who will desegregate white communities. In this particular case, many African-American Catholic families that could trace their lineage to the earliest days of the church and the free and enslaved people who built it um, will send many of their children into religious life. These are the famous Thomas sisters of Akron, Ohio, the Thomas family, a devout family with roots in uh, Kentucky and Lebanon, Kentucky, send three of their oldest daughters into the Franciscan handmaids of the most pure heart of Mary, the youngest of the African-American teaching sisterhoods, and then another daughter, a younger daughter, who um, Josephine, who desegregates an all-white community in Cleveland, Ohio. They can trace their lineage to the family of Mary Eliza Spaulding Smith and her husband, Pius Smith. In the case of Mary Eliza Spaulding Smith, she was actually enslaved by the extended family of two early American bishops, Bishop John Lancaster Spaulding and Martin Spaulding, as well as an early women's congregational leader, Sister Catherine Spaulding, who was the founders of the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, all of whom are slaveholders. Her husband, Pius, who we believe was also enslaved, uh, we don't have any records confirming that yet, but what we absolutely know is that he is a plasterer and he is one of those laborers. We do know that enslaved people helped to build the Trappist Monastery in Kentucky where Thomas Merton wrote the Seven Story Mountain. But we know that Pius Smith was one of the men who built that, who contributed to that as well. Their son will become one of the first four African-American SVD priests, Father Vincent Smith. He will also become the first African-American Trappist monk. Um, so there are lots and lots of connections. So again, it was truly serendipitous for me to receive this invitation today, um, to receive this invitation to be here today. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Indeed, Black Sisters brought me to Thomas Merton. So it only seems fitting that I bring the history of Black Sisters to you. And so we'll start. <laughs> with the only black Catholic sister that I knew growing up. 
And that was Sister Mary Clarence. But I want to tell you a little bit about how I came to study Black Catholic sisters um, and how I came to write Subversive Habits. My book began really as an attempt to make sense of what I consider to be a rather extraordinary newspaper story and photograph that I stumbled upon in early 2007. At the time, I was in graduate school and in a desperate search of a paper topic for my seminar in African American history. And I wanted to impress my professor. And so I had gone into the library and gone into microfilmed editions of old African-American owned newspapers in search of a little known dimension of the past. And while scanning through a roll of the Pittsburgh Courier, I finally encountered a 1968 article announcing the formation of a Black Power Federation of Catholic nuns called the National Black Sisters Conference. The article's title alone, Black Sisters Way Contradictions in Christian and Secular Community, immediately piqued my interest. However, it was the accompanying photograph of four smiling Black Catholic sisters that steadied my hand on the microfilm reader that day. As I said, up until that moment, I, a lifelong Catholic, had never seen a Black nun except in a Hollywood film. And in fact, the only Black sister that I knew at the time was Sister Mary Clarence the fictional character played by Whoopi Goldberg in the critically acclaimed Sister Act film franchise. Deeply ashamed of my ignorance, I soon learned that I was not alone. Even my mother, who had attended Catholic schools for the entirety of her formal education, and who in 1974 became one of the first three Black women to graduate from the University of Notre Dame here, was unaware of the existence of Black nuns in our church. And that's my mother in pink. So my mother was actually a student here at St. Mary's from 1970 to 1972. And then in 1972, Notre Dame began admitting women. And my mother and her two best friends met with Father Hesburgh and asked if they could enroll. And he said yes. And they graduated two years later. No, only white nuns taught us in our schools, my mother relayed to me on the telephone later that evening but I wish I had known. I wish we'd had black nuns in Savannah when I was growing up. Stunned by my mother's revelation, I set out to learn as much as I could about the National Black Sisters Conference and to understand the roots of the invisibility of black Catholic sisters in our lives. From Father Cyprian Davis's landmark study of the US black Catholic community, I discovered among many things that there had been black nuns in my mother's hometown of Savannah, Georgia in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Before anti-black prejudice and violent threats pushed these consecrated women out, members of two separate all black sisterhoods had helped to lay the foundation for and ensure the survival of the city's black Catholic educational system. Their heroic efforts made my mother's and by extension my own journey into Catholicism possible. Yet the white sisters and priests who taught my mother and hundreds of other black children in Savannah during America's civil rights and black power years never once alluded to black sisters in their lessons. According to my mother, her white instructors did not teach any black history or art either. And after calling and writing a host of Catholic institutions in an attempt to drag down many of the sisters and ex-sisters who had established the conference, I finally began to understand why. The saga of America's Black women who dared to be poor, chaste, and obedient is largely untold, wrote Sister Mary Sean Copeland in 1975. It is an uneasy story, not only because it is rooted in the American dilemma, racism, but also because the position of a woman in an oppressed group is traditionally delicate and strategic. Now, by the time that I interviewed her, Dr. Copeland was a distinguished professor of theology at Boston College and the first African-American president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. She had also been out of religious life for 13 years. In the 1960s and 1970s, however, Copeland, who was the first African-American Felician sister in Detroit, Michigan, and later an Adrian Dominican sister, had been one of the conference's most visible leaders. She had also done more than anyone else to preserve the organization's memory in the face of marginalization and erasure. In addition to publishing the first scholarly article on the National Black Sisters Conference, 
Dr. Kirkland in the early 2000s, uh, made it possible for the arrangement of the deposit of the organization's papers at Marquette University. I'm so glad you're interested in the Black Sisters Conference Dr. Copeland relayed to me during our first conversation. We've been waiting on someone to tell this story. Now, while Dr. Copeland's willingness to share her experiences with me proved pivotal, it was Dr. Patricia Gray, the conference's founding president and one of the four Black sisters that I showed you in that photo in the, from the Pittsburgh Courier, who radically changed my book's focus. Routinely described by her women and men peers as one of the most intellectually talented and charismatic Catholic sisters of her generation, Gray, who was known in religion as Sister M. Martin de Porres, had been the conference's heart and soul in its formative years. As Pittsburgh's first Black religious sister of mercy and the conference's leading public voice, Gray was also the face and force of what many were calling the new Black nun. However, in 1974, Gray abruptly departed religious life and stopped giving interviews related to the conference. I don't like to look back, Dr. Gray frequently repeated during the first of our com many conversations over the years. However, after I presented her with a uh, copy of a recently published book on Catholic sisters activism and the black freedom struggle of the 1960s and 1970s, she quickly changed her mind. Visibly frustrated by the book's erasure of Black Sisters Vanguard activism in the Catholic fight for racial justice, its cursory mention of White Sisters' longstanding practices of discrimination, and its glaring omission about the one Black nun briefly discussed in its pages, the 65-year-old ex-nun quietly stood and departed the room. Several minutes later, she returned with a treasure trove, her personal archive from her tenure in religious life. In handing over the materials, Dr. Gray revealed that in the 1970s, the conference's executive board had desired to publish a book documenting Black sisters' history in the United States. She also lamented to me the enduring, about the enduring invisibility of Black sisters' lives and labors in church and wider American history. Then in her great wisdom, Dr. Gray gently encouraged me to consider expanding my attention to the mostly unsung an under-researched history of the nation's Black sisterhoods. We, the conference, were not the first Black sisters to revolt in the church, she quietly declared. If you can, try to tell all of our stories. And so in my book, I recover the voices of a group of Black American church women whose lives, labors, and struggles have been systematically ignored, routinely dismissed as insignificant, and too often reduced to myth. For 13 years, I sought the untold stories of the nation's Black Catholic sisters, and I found no accounts bearing any resemblance to the fabled Hollywood tale of Sister Mary Clarence. I also failed to encounter Black sisters whose lived experiences confirmed many of the, of the existing narratives of American Catholicism, or even the master story of Catholic sisters in the United States. Instead, from a host of widely ignored archival sources, previously sealed church records, out of print books, periodicals, and over 100 oral history interviews, I bore witness to a profoundly unfamiliar history. One that disrupts and revises much of what has been said and written about the US Catholic Church and the place of Black people within it. Because it is impossible to narrate Black sisters' journey in the United States accurately and honestly, without confronting the church's largely unacknowledged and unreconciled histories of colonialism, slavery, and segregation, I address these violent systems of power and their perpetrators, men and women, directly. In so doing, my book recovers what I consider to be an overlooked chapter in the history of the long African-American freedom struggle a tradition of sustained Black Catholic resistance to white supremacy and exclusion that most scholars argue does not exist. When confronted with the silence past, the greatest responsibility of the historian and the most radical thing any person can do is to tell the story that was never meant to be told. 
My book, then, Subversive Habits, marks a new starting point in historical truth-telling in the Catholic Church and wider American society. For far too long, scholars of the American Catholic and Black past have unconsciously or consciously declared by virtue of misrepresentation, marginalization, and outright erasure that the history of Black Catholic nuns does not matter. In offering the first full survey of Black sisters' lives and struggles in the United States, my book unequivocally demonstrates that their history does matter and has always mattered. Significant about the United States and significant about the history of Black Catholics within the United States is that the first articulation, the first Black articulation of Christianity in the land area that becomes our nation, this nation, is Catholicism. In fact, the first Christian marriage that takes place in the territory that becomes the United States takes place in 1565 in Spanish Florida, and it's an interracial marriage. And it's between a free Black Catholic woman from Spain and a Spanish conquistador. That the African foundations of American Catholicism are just as old as the European foundations of American Catholicism. That there have always been two transatlantic stories of American Catholicism. One that begins with Europe and another one that begins with African descended people who are living in Europe and also those that come as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. Indeed, the story of American slavery in what become, or slavery in what becomes the United States does not begin in 1619, despite, pipe, despite popular contention. It begins over 50 years earlier in Spanish Florida. It is the Catholic Church that inaugurates African slavery in, the, in what becomes the United States, as it had done in the Americas as a whole. And that the cradles of American Catholicism are not in the Northeast or even in the Midwest that the earliest foundations of the church are in the South, in Florida, Louisiana, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri. And that is where you will find the oldest roots of the Black Catholic community that will give rise to the earliest generations of Black Catholic sisters in the United States. Also significant, Although the United States will receive a very, very small portion of those African descended people who are taken and brought into the Americas as a result of the transatlantic slave trade, it will be the United States that gives rise to the, uh, the modern world's first communities, religious communities for women, freely open to women and girls of African descent. It should have been Brazil. The vast majority of those that are taken end up in Brazil, which is at the center of the Black Catholic world up until the last half of the 20th century. But the first community freely open to Black women and girls in Brazil is not founded until 1928. That's almost a century after the Oblate Sisters of Providence are successfully founded in Baltimore, Maryland. In the history of the United States, there have been eight historically Black sisterhoods. All were founded in the South and all but one were or were slated to be teaching communities. It is with the formation of Black orders in response to the anti-Black admissions policies of the nation's European and white American communities that make religious life possible for African-American women and also women of African descent in other spaces. The African-American sisterhoods are always multilingual and multi-ethnic communities because they are always preserving the vocations not only of those young women and girls who are rejected mission into white communities in the United States, but also those who are rejected in Canada, Latin America, and the Caribbean as well. Also significant in the case of the Black orders, although they make religious life possible for African Americans, it's important to remember that there are vocations that are lost prior to the formation of Black orders. Indeed, we know that there was a failed community in Kentucky in 1824, but even before that, we know as early as 1819, that's where we find the earliest documentation of African-descended women coming from Louisiana who are seeking to go into religious life, and they're asking to be admitted into the Society of the Sacred Heart founded in the United States by St. Philippine de Chin. They are rejected. Um, they were sort of considered and they would be only admitted at a third rank, but they are eventually rejected. So sort of the great testament or gre greatest testament to the ferocity with which black vocations were rejected 
is the fact that historians can't say with any certainty who the nation's first Black Catholic sister was. The realities of racial passing, archival, the realities of racial passing and archival erasure suggest we may never know. But we certainly know that Black women are seeking to go into religious life, but they will not be successful until the formation of the Oblate Sisters of Providence. Their chief foundress is now venerable, Mother Mary Lange. Pope Francis named her venerable on yesterday. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> She is a Spanish and French speaking woman uh, born to Haitian parents in what we believe was Cuba um, and then migrated with her mother to the United States, eventually settling in Baltimore. While there, um, she and many other migrants and refugees who are fleeing the Haitian Revolution settle in Baltimore and then find themselves excluded from their church. She and several friends decide to found a school because most Black children, free and enslaved, were excluded from the, the schools in Maryland. And so they are operating a school out of their home and come to the attention of a French priest who is ministering in the, in the Black community in Baltimore uh, who wants to found a school and is directed to these young women whom he discovers also have a call to religious life that has been denied. Their founder, Father James Jobert, writes in his diary and documents the opposition that these young women had faced. He wrote, quote, for more than 10 years, they had wished to disconsecrate themselves to God for this good work, waiting patiently that in his own infinite goodness, he would show them a way of giving themselves to him. So he meets them in 1828. They have been trying to go into religious life for 10 years. We don't know who rejected them but there are only three communities of sisters that precede them in the diocese of Baltimore, which is the nation's oldest diocese. They are the fourth oldest in diocese. They are the Carmelites in Baltimore. They are the Visitation Sisters in Washington, DC, and they are St. Elizabeth Seton's Daughters of Charity, all of which are slaveholding communities. Also significant in his diary, James Jobert tells us he documents not only the opposition of white sisters, but also of the clerical community. I knew already that many persons who had approved of the idea of a school for pupils disapproved very strongly that of forming a religious house and could not think of the idea of seeing these poor girls, colored girls wearing the religious habit and constituting a religious community. He also documents that some of his peers described his endeavor as a, quote, profanation of the habit, unquote. Despite the opposition, they will survive. What is also significant about the early Oblate Sisters of Providence and why the potential sainthood of Mother Mary Lange matters so much, they are not a slave-holding community. They could have been. They are distinct. And so what is significant is that they provide the essential counterpoint to any person who dares to suggest that their slaveholding and segregationist peers are simply people of those times. It is important to remember that Mother Lange and their early Oblate Sisters of Providence are also people of those times. And they do not own enslaved people. They do not accept enslaved people um, as a part of their, their members' dowries. They do not rely on the labor of enslaved people in their ministries. But perhaps most importantly, the Oblate Sisters of Providence are the first US Catholic sisterhood to reject the racist and sexist notion that a woman born into slavery lacked the virtue necessary to enter religious life on equal terms. Indeed, before the Civil War, they will admit at least eight women who were born into slavery into their ranks. If you go to their archives, they still have the manumission papers for their members. This is one, Ellen Joseph West, who was born enslaved. We know a lot about her, in part because at the turn of the 20th century, she is believed to be the oldest Catholic sister in the United States. And so a lot of newspapers do stories on her. She's in the Washington Post, she's in the New York Times. So we know a lot about her. And the community also has her manumission records. Many of the earliest black sisters who entered the Oblate Sisters of Providence had evidenced a revolutionary call to education, Catholic education for black children and calls to religious life. Another early member, a name you might recognize, certainly in connection to Georgetown University's ongoing efforts to make reparation for its slaveholding past, was a young woman named Anne Marie Beecraft. 
who became Oblate Sister of Providence, Mary Aloysius. At the age of 15 in 1820, she founds Washington DC's first Catholic school for black girls. She's there, she gains the support of the Jesuits. They sort of bring her school very close to Georgetown. She is sort of recognized as having a vocation. They describe her, um, her piety, her beauty, et cetera. But then the big question is why would the church, the Jesuits who are slaveholding and other slaveholding communities be, be willing to help this young woman? What we also know, according to the historical record that has survived, is that she is the granddaughter of Charles Carroll of Carrollton, that her father, William B. Craft, was, quote, the natural son of Charles Carroll of Carrollton and a free woman of color who worked in his household. Charles Carroll of Carrollton is the only Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence. He is one of Maryland's largest enslavers, and he is cousin to Bishop John Carroll, who was the nation's inaugural bishop. That explains why her connection, her blood connection explains why that would be possible. She is to date the only Catholic sister that we've been able to find that has a blood right, a birthright to the early nation in the church. And that comes through the Carroll family. The Oblate Sisters of Providence, despite profound opposition to their president, presence will survive. In the case of the school that was founded by Mother Lange, Venerable Mary Lange, St. Francis Academy, it is still with us. It is the nation's oldest continuously serving Black Catholic school. And the Oblates are still with us. The second successful African-American sisterhood are the uh, Sisters of the Holy Family, founded in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1842. Their foundress is another African-American on the road to sainthood. She is Venerable Henriette DeLille. This particular story is also important, but distinct from the Oblate Sisters of Providence. The Oblate Sisters of Providence are not a slaveholding community. The Sisters of the Holy Family do own some enslaved people, and that makes them distinct. Also, when they are founded, they institute a color barrier. So only women of elite backgrounds who are lighter skinned can enter the community. And so they will eventually sort of get rid of that barrier after the Civil War, but it distinguishes them from the Oblate Sisters of Providence. These are women who feel called to religious life, who want to serve their community by educating children, but who are also rejected on the basis of race. Many of these women are also seeking to escape the system of sexual exploitation and concubinage that was known as plissage, which was in French controlled territories and Spanish controlled territories where European men would take enslaved and free black women as their concubines. Many of these women are the products of these relationships and their first historian tells us so. That's even true with their foundress, Henriette de Lille. What we know from the historical record is that she is the great, great granddaughter of Claude de Bruyere who was the inaugural French royal engineer, whose uh, crews of free and enslaved men built the earliest roads in New, or New Orleans, built the first canals, and interestingly enough, also built the, built the old Ursuline convent that his great-great-granddaughter would never be able to enter on the basis because of race. Their first historian, Sister Mary Bernard Dex, told us, all of the sisters were of the very first families of the city, and only one sister, Suzanne Navarre, was a stranger from Boston. As for the rest, they were all natives of the state, but their fathers were all foreigners, some French, Spanish, or German. They were all descended from the first settlers of Louisiana. Indeed, one of the earliest sisters was a descendant of the Spanish Catholic Pintado family, and these were Spanish Catholics who surveyed much of Spanish Florida and Louisiana. We also know that they face profound resistance from within the church, including from other sisters. In particular, the case of the Sisters of the Holy Family, they're not the first sisters, community of sisters to minister in Louisiana, that they are the Ursulines, the Ursulines are the first. What's significant though is the Sisters of the Holy Family are the first community of sisters to be established in the state of Louisiana. There are other sisterhoods ministering in Louisiana before them, but they had all come from France. They are the first indigenous congregation in Louisiana. And for the first 40 or 50 years of their existence, the bishop denied them the right to wear habits to signify their consecrated status. This is their sister again, their first historian. We had a very hard time for we had many enemies who wanted to degrade our dear little community as poor as we were. We were persecuted by the sisters of St. Joseph in this city. 
they tried all they could do to make us take off our habits. That was after 45 or 50 years that we had worked to suffer and have a religious habit. No one would think we were anything if we were not dressed in the holy habit. And in the case of the Sisters of St. Joseph, they had arrived in New Orleans in 1866 after the Civil War. And the Holy Family Sisters had by this time, um, well, by the 1870s, had won the right to wear habits. But the sisters, when they got their habits, the sisters of St. Joseph thought that the Holy Family habit was too similar to that of their lay sisters, their lowest ranked sisters. And so they wage a public campaign to either have them change their habit or take it off completely. And they're forced to change it because they want the Black sisters recognized as the lowest ranked sisters. And so they are forced to change their habit, but they do endure. And indeed here, if you see, this sister right here, this is Anne Marie Finn Vizenda. She is a descendant of the Pintado family. She is the sixth member of the community. The community and their school, St. Mary's Academy, which is the nation's second oldest continuously serving academy, are still with us. The third of the communities that is still with us are the Franciscan Handmaids of the Most Pure Heart of Mary that were established in Savannah, Georgia in 1916 in response to a law that had been introduced in the Georgia State Legislature that would have banned white teachers from teaching Black children and Black teachers from teaching white children. And had it passed, it would have effectively barred Black children from the Catholic educational system in Savannah because there were no Black sisters there. In response, a white priest who is ministering in the African-American community sends word to the Oblates and the Holy Family Sisters to see if they can send sisters in to ensure that African-Americans will maintain access to the Catholic educational system. They don't have any sisters to spare. So this priest goes in search of a pious laywoman to found a community. And while he's visiting a friend at the Catholic University of America, he is made aware of a former nun who was working as a domestic for the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur at their Trinity College, which is now Trinity Washington University. And according to his diary, he says, he explains to Eliza Barbara Williams what is going on in Savannah. She leaves the room, comes back with her life savings and says, I will be there. And within six months, she is, she is in Savannah. And within a year, she's recruited women uh, to save the community, to save African-American access to the Catholic educational system in Savannah. They are the first Catholic sisterhood to be organized in direct protest against a Jim Crow law. Although they grow, they face profound opposition in Savannah to the point that they are forced to leave. They first go to New Jersey and work as domestic for the society, domestics for the Society of African Missions before they are invited by the Archbishop of New York to found a educational ministry for black children and Black migrant children and Caribbean immigrant children in Harlem, where they remain. The last community that I want to briefly mention is a community that integrated back into um, sort of a predominantly white community, but was established in 1922 to give Black women who felt called to a contemplative life the opportunity to pursue a contemplative vocation in an all black community because contemplative communities would not accept black women. These were the Magdalens, which were an all black branch of the Magdalens connected to the Sisters of the Good Shepherd. Um, they exist as an all black contemplative community in Baltimore from 1922 until the 1960s. There are no archival records documenting their history. We only have these two photos that were contained in the black Catholic press. Uh, we know in the 1960s, they integrated into the all white Good Shepherd sisters um, and most of them remain. I say 2022 because one Magdalene was still alive when I came to this project. Her name was Sister Nellie Hawkins. And so while there's no archival evidence on this community, Sister Nellie helped me identify all the women in these community, in these photographs. And she just died last year. Now for the vast majority of African-American women who have gone into religious life in the United States, there've been over 2,500 that we can identify the overwhelming majority entered the Black orders. However, we do have examples of Black women going into white communities, even in the 19th century, and then after World War II, where there is a concerted effort on the part of some communities to begin to rethink the utility and morality of their anti-Black admissions policies. So not only are Black sisters among the earliest sisters to minister in the United States, 
they not only lead the Black communities, but we do have examples of them leaving, leading some white communities. Those that go in the 19th century generally are Black women who, can, who are racially ambiguous. Um, and they didn't necessarily need to be able to pass as white because many white congregations would take Native American women, they would take Latina women, they would take women of Asian descent. It's Blackness is the bar. So as, as long as you could be something else, you could potentially get admitted into a community as long as you keep the secret. We even have examples of Black sisters even founding white communities. These are the sister servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the IHM sisters, a distinguished community of educators who have their own colleges. Their two chief foundresses are two former Oblate sisters of Providence who can pass who pass for white. In 1845, their community runs into a problem when Father James Jobert dies and the Archbishop of Baltimore attempts to suppress the community, telling the sisters that they should just go be maids. In the, inter, in the moment of crisis, a Belgian priest steps in and preserves the community. But in the moment of crisis, a couple of members decide to leave and they end up receiving an invitation to found the first community of sisters in the first Catholic school in the state of Michigan, which will be the IHM sisters. There's a third sister who wants to join them, but she receives word that she's too dark and they tell her not to come because it's clear they can only found a white community. Their chief foundress was also a charter member of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, Mother Teresa Maxis Duchemin. She is successful in the foundation of the IHM sisters. The community grows very quickly, again, eventually expanding into Pennsylvania, first in Western Pennsylvania, and eventually into Eastern Pennsylvania. However, she's a bit headstrong. The bishops know her secret, um, but because she's also very independent, she runs afoul of the bishops. Indeed, in their correspondence, they oftentimes refer to her racial heritage, referring to her as a cunning mulatto, among many other things. As the community begins to expand out of Michigan, you have one bishop writing to another in 1859. I tremble when I think of the impression which we made when our good people discovered that their daughters have been sent to be placed under a mulatto superior. I do not think we are yet right for such an anomaly. Recognizing the dangers of having her community split, Mother Teresa Maxis goes into exile, and she goes into exile with the, with the Great Nuns of Ottawa, where she remains for almost 20 years before she's allowed to come back into her community and die. After she dies, her community embarks upon a path of erasing her and their African-American heritage, citing their third member as their real foundress. And then for the next several decades, the community engages in this conspiracy of silence, closing off their archives to reach searchers because they knew that anyone who came into the archive would find out what they were and their foundations. This is from 1928 with one superior making it clear. We are convinced that silence is the fairest, wisest, and most agreeable way of committing to oblivion this subject. In the 1990s, the community formally apologized for what they had done adopted an anti-racist platform, and among many things, opened up their archives so that it could be clear what they had done. However, even to this day, if you go to any IHM website or the school, you will only see the image of their founders, Teresa Maxa Duchman, this one on the right. This is an etching of their founders. It's based off of the only photo that they have of her, um, but you will only see this image. And when I was doing my research, when I contacted the arch archive, I asked for a photo. And the archivist said, well, do you want the etching or do you want the photo? And I said, well, I'll take both um, because I didn't know the difference until I saw it. On the right, it's the etching based on the photo. And Mother Teresa, Teresa is wearing the habit of the community that she found at the IHM Sisters. The photo is dangerous because she's not wearing the habit of the community that she founded. She's wearing the habit of the Grey Nuns of Ottawa. The photo was taken while she's in exile. It documents the exile. And that's why they don't use the image because then you have to explain exactly what happened. And so for people who are still unaware of the African-American roots of the IHM sisters, if you go to the website, you won't necessarily find it. You have to sort of find the photograph before you can really see it. 
We have other examples. The Sisters of Charity of New York had a Black superior uh, in the 19th century born to a, either a free or an enslaved Black mother and a British planter father in Charleston. She is described in their only written history as their most hidden of the mother's general. And that is because after she died, one of her successors went into the archive and destroyed everything related to her except a prayer book and rosary. When I gave a talk to the Leadership Conference of Women Religious in 2016, I mentioned this story and I was invited by that community to come to their mother house. And they said, that's true, but that's not everything. And, they see, and the superior at the time said, you know, that's true. But that person who did, tried to destroy everything didn't. And among many things that were saved was a photograph of her, um, which I include in my book. Black women who could not pass for white or anything else, who went into white communities in the United States, all were forced to leave the United States to enter European communities willing to accept their vocations. But they are always uh, admitted only on an unequal basis. This is Frederica Law, who enters into the novitiate of the Missionary Franciscan Sisters of the Immaculate Conception in Rome as a lay candidate. Um, she is allowed to profess her vows on her deathbed because she becomes very ill and dies and, bury, and is buried in Rome. This is Frances Johnson of Baltimore, Maryland, who enters into the novitiate of the Franciscan Sisters of Mill Hill in London in 1885. She's only allowed to train as a tertiary. She comes back, receives her, uh, receives sort of a tertiary sort of habit, labors with the community into her death um, in 1894. And although that particular community ministered exclusively in the African-American community, they did not accept another African-American uh, candidate until the 1960s. They tracked all of their other uh, applications to the Diablo Sisters of Providence. This is Mother Matilda Beasley, who is both of Native American and African-American descent, who founds the first community for Black sisters uh, in Savannah, Georgia in the late 19th century but she receives her training from a poor Clare community in, U in York, England. Significant about her story is that when her community begins to falter uh, in the late 19th century, she is encouraged by her bishop to go meet with a young woman who had just founded a community to minister in the African-American and Native American communities in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. And that was Catherine Drexel, who is now St. Catherine Drexel. We know from the historical record from the SBS annals that Mother Matilda and her assistant go meet with Catherine Drexel and they ask to be integrated into the community. And it's at this time that the community takes a vote to exclude not only African-American but Native American women. And they say so because the sisters will not live with Native American or African-American women on equal terms, even though they minister in those communities. And what's significant is that in the, in the annals, they describe Mother Matilda as a very saintly colored woman, but they still will not help her in any way. Also significant, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament had actually just accepted a Native American woman a few weeks before, that they had only admitted her as a house sister, meaning that she was relegated to domestic labor and cooking. But as soon as Mother Matilda comes, that's when they take the vote. And from that point until the 1950s, they track all their Native American candidates um, to, the, uh, to white communities that would accept Native Americans, and they track their African American applicants to the Black orders. There are other examples through up until World War II. We know that the US, first US provincial of the Sisters of the Holy Family of Nazareth, which was a Polish community, she will adopt at least six African-American girls who are born in Catholic hospitals or in Catholic orphanages, three of whom become members of the community. In most cases though, black women, when they are presented with the opportunity to enter a white community, if you were racially ambiguous, um, even if you could pass for white, you were still required to cut off ties with your black family members. You could not have your parents visit you you could not do any of that. And so when many of these African-American women are presented with this option, they say they won't do it, they go to the black orders. One such example was Rebecca Clifford, who was educated by the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, who rejected an offer to go into a white sisterhood in Philadelphia on the condition that she passed her white and, and cut ties with her visibly black mother. 
In this particular case, she had an older brother who was going to pass her white. He was going to leave Virginia, go pass her white in Philadelphia, and he didn't want to leave his sister behind. And so he finds a priest that finds a community that's willing to accept her, but under those conditions. And she refuses. And she's also rejected from the SBS, but they sort of tell us what she says. And this is a really important moment. She enters the oblate. She becomes one of their most distinguished superiors. But this is what she's doing as a young woman um, at the turn of the 20th century. Telling her, telling her educator, her, her confidant, that I should not have my mother visit me, I think positively wrong and not the will of God. My mother is making a great sacrifice and giving up her only daughter to God. She is doing it most willingly. Should I impose an unnecessary sacrifice upon her? My decision in this is that the white people have many to work for them, but the colored people have very few. They are my own people, and I think God wants me to give them the first place. And I don't think that I would be blessed if I were to do otherwise. And so she stays in the Black community, which is true for so many. We know an early Mary Noel sister, their first congreg their congregation's first treasurer is also a Black woman passing for white. In her case, though, she tells the community, I will come into the community, but I will not be cut off from my stepfather or my sister who are Black. And they take the vote and they're very impressed with her. And so they allow her to remain. However, if you up until a few years ago, they never identified her. And this is Frances Douglas, Sister Mary Frances. She was born Elsie St. Clair Davis, excuse me, Davis. And she was not identified as their first Black member. They would only identify a Black woman who went in, Sister Geneva Lassiter, who went in in 1956 as their first Black member. They have since begun to identify uh, Frances Davis as their first Black member. Sometimes Black women who can pass for white who who are in white communities get caught and they are removed. This is Mildred Dobier, who was removed, who's caught passing for white in a community of religious sisters of mercy in St. Louis in 1929. She's from Mobile, Alabama. She comes from a very elite Afro-Creole family. Um, after her father dies, the community, the, the siblings all scatter because their protection is gone. Some go west and she goes north to St. Louis. In her case, what happens, someone from Mobile writes the superior and says, I don't know if you know this, but you have mulatto in your ranks and she has to come out. She is removed. However, she's allowed to go into the visit, well, not allowed, but she's able to get into the, a visitation monastery in Richmond, Virginia. She successfully passes for white until her death in 1963. No one knew until I literally came across a note about it. And after a very, very long time, was able to get a photo of her. Um, but I also had to make her family aware that they didn't realize that they had at one time acknowledged their African heritage. And then when they left, did not know. But the family was very happy to know when they gave me the photograph of Perone Marie. Even in those cases though, even black women who could pass for white and who applied to white congregations, most of them could not go in. Most of them were tracked to the black orders. Most white communities would not even make exceptions for even racially ambiguous black women. This is Innocence Chenoweth, um, Sister Mary Alice Chenoweth, uh, Oblate Sister of Providence who was denied admission into her educators, the Sisters of Charity of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Rock Island, Illinois. Um, and then later by Mother Catherine Drexel, um, who made her aware of the existence of the Oblate Sisters of Providence. She enters that community in 1936 and remains until her death. She is born to a German-American mother and an African-American father. What's very significant about this story is that her mother, German-American, after her father dies, her mother becomes a lay assistant for the BVM sisters, and she only ministers in their Black schools because she knows that they do not accept Black girls. And she also knows that the BVMs do not tell them about the existence of Black orders. And so the vocations are lost. And so I met and interviewed several Oblate Sisters of Providence who told me, they said, my vocation was saved by Sister Mother, by, by her mother. I was educated by the VBMs. She was a lay assistant in our school. I was rejected. I was heartbroken. And then this woman came and told me that there was a community that was accepting of, that would be accepting of me. And so without oral history, we would never know that particular story of what her mother did um, after the rejections and after the death of her husband. 
So again, you have these stories and that's true of the black orders. This is the story of devout black Catholic women and girls traveling hundreds and even thousands of miles away from their hometowns and their families to enter communities willing to accept them. These are the famous Burke sisters of Louisville, Kentucky, whose parents come out of the Holy Land of Kentucky. They send five of their daughters to the Oblate Sisters of Providence because no communities in Kentucky will accept their daughters. One sister becomes ill and she comes home, but the four remain and they remain until their deaths. And the last Burke sister just died a few years ago. These are the prices of Baltimore, Maryland, who send four of their daughters to the Oblate Sisters of Providence and one son to the Josephites, which is a community of priests that minister exclusively in the Black community. It's not until World War II that we begin to see changes, communities beginning to open up, contemplative communities first. In the case of the first interracial Dominican monastery and monastery in general established, it comes as a result after two African-American women are denied admission into a white uh, Dominican monastery just outside of Baltimore. In response to that rejection, three white members of that community leave to found an interracial community that would be accepting regardless of race. We see communities in St. Louis, a nursing community open up first. And as communities begin to open up after World War II, after the promulgation of the, 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 the doctrine of the mystical body of Christ, we see communities begin to consider accepting Black candidates, although the pioneering members of these communities were oftentimes admitted on a segregationist basis. So, for example, these are the first uh, African-American Sisters of St. Mary, um, which was a historically German nursing community in St. Louis. They accept three in 1946 in July of that year, two more later that year, but they are completely segregated in their community. They live separately, they build a separate novitiate for them, they eat, they dine separately, but they're also a, they are also members of a handful of Black sisters and white communities who were forced to profess their vows in segregated ceremonies. One sister told me she was on her way to profession, the profession ceremony, and she was stopped at the door and said that they would not allow her to profess to, as to not offend the white parents there, and so they took her into the sacristy and made her profess there. In this particular instance, we see the segregated profession. And I wanna just draw your attention to one aspect of this photo. If you see these two nuns right here, these are black nuns. These are members of the Oblate Sisters of Providence. Anytime that they found out that a white community was accepting an African-American girl, they always went as a show of solidarity. Many of these young women were their, their, were their pupils. Those were their students. And so they were always there to show uh, in an act of solidarity, but also to help preserve because many pioneering black sisters and white congregations don't make it. Some of them transfer to the black orders, but certainly if a black woman doesn't remain in religious life, her records are closed. And so we can't even begin to know how many actually um, were lost even in this episode in this era of desegregation. What becomes critically important is the importance of not only sort of white priests who minister in the African-American community, but also white sisters who are beginning to sort of rethink the utility of these anti-Black admissions policies. White priests become essential in this fight because they have to write letters of recommendation. And oftentimes what you find is that white priests who minister in the African-American community do not want the Black girls in their parishes to experience the rejection. So they write the letters themselves. Here you have it in the general council minutes of the Religious Sisters of Mercy. Here's a priest sending in an application for two colored postulants. And the superior in Chicago is reported that she is being faced with the problem of accepting colored girls as postulants. She understands that a priest is sending in an application to enter, for these two girls to enter the novitiate. The problem was discussed by the general council, but no action was taken. Mother asked the members of the general council to give it serious thought and fervent prayer. Some white priests take it upon themselves again to write the letters for themselves. This is one white priest in Harlem writing to all the superiors in New York in 1946, basically in the form of a general inquiry, although he gets to the meat of his point in the second line. Is the order Catholic enough to accept colored vocations? I'm in a colored parish and I'm immediately concerned with this information. And what he gets back is no, no, no. 
In the case of the Religious Sisters of Mercy, they get so many applications that they write to the Vatican for help. Enclosed is a copy of a letter that I received from one of our mothers provincial relative to the acceptance of colored girls to our institute. The problem is forced upon us because of the number of colored students we now teach in our schools. Even though the training of colored subjects would necessarily dif differ in some respects from the training of other subjects, the colored would no doubt re resent a separate novitiate. It seems too at this time, the sisters in general would not welcome colored subjects into our present novitiates. And this is important in part, one, it tells us that black girls were considered to be problems before they ever stepped foot inside the convent, meaning that they were never even given a shot. Two, it tells us that the communities themselves recognize that they have members who are racist but that is not disqualifying for white sisters from religious life, anti-Blackness. And three, the Religious Sisters of Mercy are teaching lots and lots of Black children in Chicago and elsewhere. But what this is, is significant for us is that it reminds us that just because you teach Black children does not mean or signify a commitment to racial justice and racial equality. You don't teach Black history to them, and you will not accept them, even though these girls feel called to the charism of your community. So that's the challenge. We begin to see communities slowly open up. This is Mary Dolores Allen, who enters into the Missionary Servants of the Holy Ghost. She doesn't remain, and so her records are closed. In fact, I interviewed their only African-American member, and she told me in our interview that she was their first African-American member, and I said, you weren't. There was someone before you and she was never told. Some sisters face profound bullying in their communities. They talk about it. Some sisters are forced to leave the United States to still answer God's call on their lives. Some women decide to persevere no matter what. And I think I want to end today with the story of Sister Cormarie Billings. Sister Cormarie is still alive. She is the first African-American to be accepted into the Religious Sisters of Mercy in Philadelphia. Um, and also likely in the, in the Philadelphia Archdiocese. Significant about her, she actually had two aunts who were also educated by the Religious Sisters of Mercy in Philadelphia before her, but who were rejected on the basis of race. So Decor Marie is admitted in 1956. Her aunts had been educated in the 30s and 40s, and they both were forced to go into the Oblate Sisters of Providence, and they remained until their deaths. Their father, Sister Decor Marie's grandfather, John Aloysius Lee Sr., was the second African-American graduate of Roman Catholic High School in Philadelphia, which is the nation's oldest Catholic high school, and was actually the first African-American to ever play in a Catholic basketball league. Very talented, to the point when we graduate, he gets a job with the post office, becomes a supervisor, distinguished layman. He's the first African-American to, to win the Vercelli Medal from the Philadelphia Archdiocese, recognizing distinguished lay persons. But he also, in Philadelphia, founded all of the earliest Black athletics leagues, the first for, for girls and boys, basketball, tennis, swimming, golf, et cetera, because they were excluded. So much so that there's a park in West Philadelphia named after him today, the Lee Recreation System, Center. His father, William Henry Lee, was one of the enslaved people owned by the Jesuits at Georgetown. So when we talk about who these pioneering Black sisters are, who are these women who make up the story of America's real sister act? They are women, some of whom are converts, but many also who can trace their lineage to the earliest days of the church. Indeed, if you ask Black sisters what the greatest legacy of their foremothers in the church are, they will tell you immediately. They will tell you that we made the church Catholic, that the Catholic church would not be Catholic if it wasn't for us. For far too many people, Whoopi Goldberg's performance as Sister Mary Clarence and Sister Act is the dominant interpretation of an African-American sister and the desegregation of a white Catholic sisterhood. But what I argue is that the story of America's real Sister Act is far more compelling. This is the story of how generations of devout Black Catholic women and girls fought against racism, sexism, and exclusion to answer God's call in their lives 
to become and minister as women religious. This is their story. These are the individuals who understood that racism had no place within the Catholic Church, that no barrier should be there. It also helps us to understand why the members of the nation's historically Black sisterhoods and many Black sisters who are members of white sisterhoods still wear the veil. They said we fought too hard to have them. We will never give them up. It's why when you see Black sisters, you'll generally see them wearing the veil. So thank you. Shannon, I hope you just receive that blessing on your work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yesterday, the theme of liminality and borderlands was prominent in our discussion as the place of wisdom, as the place of uh, where we learn what we have not yet learned. So thank you for saying their names uh, and bringing them back into our presence. Um, Shannon has agreed to take a couple of questions and I'm also told that our time is limited to about less than 10 minutes. Uh, so please, if you have a, have a question, we do have microphones. Uh, and emphasis on question and brief so that we might hear from uh, several in the time that we have remaining. Okay. Sorry. Um, thank you so very much. Um, what I wanted to ask uh, is, do you know anything about um, the the, co the codes by which the um, uh, the sisterhoods were organized in the sense of their regulations? There, um, I mean, the canon law didn't really exist in that way we're knowing it nowadays. But do you know anything that was actually regulated from above for them? Um, I, I just find that an interesting question where practically the um, desegregation and all this was written down, was um, located in the church law. Thank you so much for that question. Um, it's why the sisters actually sort of write to the Vatican. Um, there, there were formal policies. Now, when we see this written into the law, we see it in Latin America, where sort of church law and secular law, the same things where you do not have that, that women of color, especially women of African descent, and also some indigenous American women are also formally barred from entering religious life. So they can only become religious servants of a community. They take simple vows, but they are relegated to domestic service. You have some extraordinary examples of these black women um, allowed to profess full vows on their deathbed in places like Mexico and Peru. Um, but in the United States, they're formal, they're written, although after World War II with the promulgation of the mystical body of Christ, there is sort of this understanding that these distinctions may no, may no longer be able to stand, which is why you see communities writing to the Vatican and asking for permission. We certainly see it in the regulations in African sisters. And in this particular case, the Vatican does respond to the Religious Sisters of Mercy. And they say, in the case of the Religious Sisters of Mercy, they're getting so many applications, they ask the Vatican if they can found, create an all Negro province in Chicago. Um, and they're given approval to do so, but the Cardinal in Chicago steps in to say that the problem of racism is so, such an issue, it would become such an, a problem that you can't do it. Um, but this was something that would have been approved by the Vatican. We certainly see that this is sort of 
uh, guiding principles in Africa with the formation of these separate and unequal all African congregations affiliated with European and white American communities. But in the United States, um, oftentimes really the superiors of the community have the final say. Sometimes they even sort of um, ask the Vatican but then they oftentimes even defy sort of the rule of the archbishop. So for example, in Cleveland, Ohio, the Bishop of Cleveland meets with every white sisterhood in the diocese in 1950 and gives them an hour to decide whether or not they're gonna take a vote and accept black women. He uses his influence to do that. And this is why certain communities do accept their first and only African-American members. In other instances, we have communities who are doing everything in their power to stop it. They defy the bishop, they will not accept them. And they begin to sort of come up with different kinds of policies to be able to evade desegregation. They establish quotas. They only accept one or two a year. The Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament say we're only going to take two or three a year after pressure from white priests forces them to take a vote. Also, what you begin seeing is that communities begin requesting photographs. And that is key. As integration comes, schools that were previously all white become mixed or they have black populations. And so prior to integration, even if a black woman is applying to a white order, the name of her, the order of nuns that taught her would give her away or her parish would give her away, right? Because the names of black parishes are often they're named after African saints or the order of, of nuns that are teaching black children, it will give you away if you don't identify yourself. But as integration comes, you can't screen applications in the ways in which you can. So for example, an African-American candidate from a sister of Loretto school in, in California rights to come into the community in 1956, and she does not identify herself as a Negro. And so what happens is in Kentucky, they get the letter. The superior recognizes that the school has undergone a demographic change and they see her last name, which is Creole. And so she writes to her superior in California. She says, do you know this girl? Is she a Negro? So that's why they begin to ask for photographs. You're never asking for photographs before, but you're doing so to be able to scan to, to screen the applications. Such was the case for another African-American woman. She was both African-American and Puerto Rican. She's denied admission into all the white communities in New York City. She writes to a community in Kentucky, the Congregation of Divine Providence. They ask for her photograph, she's rejected. What does she do? Two years, she learns French and she applies to the Congregation of Divine Providence in France. She's admitted. What's really fascinating about that story and her name, Dr. Yvonne Irvin, who has, recently, has passed away, after she professes final vows in France, they receive a call. They need a French teacher in a school in Kentucky. So she comes with the French superior who accepted her and serves as the translator between the French superior who accepted her and the American superior who rejected her. So um, it is formal. Um, and some of it is also informal because the bullying of some of these girls was not punished. And so you have those other kinds of, of ways in which informal policies and practices also led to lost vocations. One last thing that I wanna say too is that we don't even have a sense of how many vocations were lost because so many of the women that I interviewed said, I didn't even submit an application. I asked my teacher and she said, no, the rejection was oral. So there's no written record of the rejection. So we're very fortunate that a white Jesuit priest named Father Raymond Bernard did surveys in the 1950s so we can get a sense of some of the numbers, but we don't even have a sense of how many vocations were lost because again, a lot of the women who I interviewed said it was an oral rejection and I stopped there. Thank you for that question. Sorry, that was a long answer, I'm very sorry. Maybe one more question and then we'll... <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm I'm probably because it's my first conference, I'm overwhelmed with the amount of material <laughs> this week. Um, but there's a there's a legitimate fear of this beautiful and archival expression disappearing in libraries, disappearing or not ever being present in those spaces. So, what are ways that we can not just purchase your book, which we should all do, <laughs> of course, but present it to people to ask for it to be put into anti-racist libraries and libraries in our communities. What are some options for that? 
I would also say beyond this, now the Oblates, Sisters of Providence and the Sisters of the Holy Family, the two oldest uh, Black orders have well-maintained archives. Um, the papers of the National Black Sisters Conference are at Marquette University. Like that material will be taken care of. The challenge of course is if a black woman does not remain in religious life in a white community, generally her records are closed. How do you get access to that? Or history matters. The digital record matters because the black Catholic press was great about documenting when black, when white communities took a black girl. So that's how I was able to find some people. But oral history is key. So think about it in your own parishes, in your own communities. What can you do in your archdiocese or local diocese? Are we doing oral history projects? The elders are carrying these stories. So many people reached out to me over the years. Do you know this sister? Here's this story. There are people who have this information. Let me just say, when my book came out, a woman who was educated by the Holy Family Sisters said, oh my goodness, I look for my teacher. She was in your book. I don't know if you know this, but if you've ever seen her, her signature, here's my report card. Here's her signature. I'll give you another example and then I'll stop because I know it's time. In my book in chapter three, I talk about an episode, a, hor a really terrible episode where a pioneering black sister in Chicago is sent into the suburbs to minister in a white school and the mothers revolt against her. It's, co it's covered in the press. I never could find her name. Some of the sisters were like, yeah, that happened to an Afro Puerto Rican sister in my community. I think that may be her. My book comes out and I get an email from a white priest in St. Paul, Minnesota. And he said, you know, I just saw that your book came out. And, you know, I had two lay women in my, my parish that were former nuns. I don't know if you interviewed them. They've since died, but here are their obituaries. And in one of the obituaries, it was her story. She had, she had documented in her obituary, this is who I am. This is what happened to me. She was dead, but he said, you know, and I said, oh my goodness, I was looking for her. And he said, you know, her sister and her nephew were still alive. I'll put you in contact. And they sent me her photo. And her sister was like, that's my sister. So what I say to you all is in your own communities, are you doing the oral history? Are you doing the oral histories of the people who have these stories, who have been quiet in your parishes, who are dev devoted and faithful, but who you don't know a lot about? I promise you they have stories. And so on a very basic level, I want to say the oral history is actually richer because sometimes the archives don't tell us what we need. It's the oral histories that get us there. And so you have to remember that lay people themselves are carrying these stories, but are we recognizing that they are the keepers of this history? Um, so what are you doing in your own community to sort of say, hey, what's your story? Are you interviewing them? Are you, you know, and making sure that those records go into an archive. So that's one really powerful way to sort of do this work, but I'm also happy to talk to you as well. Thank you so much.